Hello, and welcome to this brief introduction to the history of educational psychology. This presentation will focus on some important events in the field during the 20th century in the USA. My name is Bill Hewitt, and I'm Professor Emeritus at Valdosta State University and Adjunct Professor at Capella University. The presentation is narrated by Jeff Hewitt, who is helping me produce these videos. While the investigation of principles that apply to learning and teachings can be traced to ancient times, this historical overview will start at the turn of the 20th century. Educational psychology is one of the oldest fields within the discipline of psychology, as some of the earliest contributors investigated the principles of learning and teaching. Two of the earliest pioneers were John Dewey, who lived from 1858 to 1952, and Edward Thorndike, who lived from 1974 to 1949. These two researchers had very different ideas about how research and practice in the field should proceed. John Dewey, for example, thought that schools should be a central institution in the community, where not only children and youth could be acculturated into the society, but also provide opportunities for adults to better their lives. He thought the community should be an important focus of schooling and that children and youth should participate in the community as part of their formal education. More specifically, Dewey thought that the primary aim of the school should be the preparation of children and youth to live and participate in the functioning of the democracy. He thought that democracy was not easy to achieve and could be easily lost, and that effort must be given to make sure that people were prepared to keep its primary institutions functioning and developing. In order to do that, Dewey believed that three primary sets of knowledge and skills should be developed. The first attribute Dewey emphasized was the development of what he called affections, by which he meant emotions such as empathy as well as values that are important for social functioning. He also believed that the development of social skills should be emphasized as these are important for many aspects of human lives, including doing well in school, making and keeping friends, starting and maintaining a family, and doing well in one's career. Finally, he thought that the thinking skills used in scientific inquiry should be taught, including the methods that would be used in investigations in the natural and social sciences. In a word, Dewey thought that the focus of the development of children and youth should be holistic, with a dual focus of developing the individual as well as society. Edward Thorndike had quite different views on the investigation and practice of education. He identified four elements that must be addressed, to which he thought that educational psychology could make major contributions. The first element was the aims of education. In Thorndike's view, human beings are animals and need to be studied as such. In particular, he was interested in investigating the intellects, characters, and behaviors of human beings and how those could be efficiently and effectively developed. Second, Thorndike thought that educational psychology could make a contribution by studying the materials that were available in the process of this development. He thought that the social and behavioral sciences provided the best methods for studying these. Third, he thought that educational psychology could investigate the means by which development occurred. More specifically, he thought that scientists needed to study human biology as well as the primary influencers such as family, friends, and teachers. He also wanted to investigate the technologies that were available such as pencils, books, blackboards, etc. He thought that these investigations would produce the information needed to guide development in a very mechanical process. If one knew all the materials and means, one could control the processes and achieve a desired outcome. As for the methods of education, Thorndike thought that education should be guided systematically using psychologically and empirically based practices. He thought these methods should be studied and feedback provided to parents and educators so that they could improve the efficacy of their practices. Throughout the early and middle 20th century, Thorndike's views were dominant. Schooling became increasingly industrialized and standardized in its approach, with classrooms at different ages beginning to look more and more alike wherever one went. A focus on standardized assessment that became dominant in the mid-20th century added energy to this approach. In many schools, this is the dominant form seen in classrooms today. This teacher-directed approach to classroom practice is labeled instructivism, and the dominant method is called explicit or direct instruction. However, in the latter half of the 20th century, as high school graduation rates began to level off and achievement continued to decline, there has been renewed interest in methods that hark back to John Dewey's ideas expressed a century earlier. While there has been a continuation of standardized testing, there is an increased emphasis on writing and thinking rather than just testing of rote knowledge. Additionally, while the assessment of the whole person has yet to be widely accepted, there have been advances in the conceptualization of frameworks and methods to do so. For example, 
The CERTS Institute has developed a set of 40 developmental assets that are divided into two major categories. The category of external assets focus on the support from the environment that children and youth need in order to develop their full potentials. Included in this list are support from family and adult relationships, opportunities to develop empowerment by being of service to others, the establishment of boundaries and expectations that allow for growth and decision-making, part from family and adult relationships, and providing programs that allow children and youth to make constructive use of their time. The internal assets include developmental assets focused on competencies and values that children and youth need to make good decisions and to become responsible, independent adults. Examples of assets in this category include having high levels of academic motivation and engagement in school activities, positive emotion and values such as caring and honesty, social competencies such as cultural competence and skills in conflict resolution, and high levels of self-esteem and a sense of meaning and purpose. This framework articulates a set of aims that are quite similar to those presented by John Dewey and are more oriented to a student-centered approach to learning that has been labeled constructivism. The focus of educational psychology is to explore the theories and research that support an instructivist or teacher-centered approach to instruction, as well as a constructivist approach to instruction with the opportunity to explore when and for whom each of these approaches might be most appropriate. When you study educational psychology, you will have taken a major step in your goal to become competent in the role of a professional educator.